culture of Ganesha is considered the earliest representation of the elephant god. Part of the Udaigiri complex near Sanchi, in what was ancient Vidisha, this complex dates back to the 5th century CE when the Guptas were at the height of their power. The Gupta Empire lasted for around 220 years and we get a peek into their world through the temples they built and the coins that they left behind. Hordes of these, many in gold, have been found around the region of present-day Rajasthan, Uttar Pradesh and Madhya Pradesh. Sanjeev Kumar has spent over three decades tracing and studying Gupta coins and the result is this book, The Treasures of the Gupta Empire, that is an authoritative work that brings together past research and breaks new ground, offering fascinating insights into the Gupta world. Many thanks for joining us today, Sanjeev. This is a conversation that uh, we've been planning for a very long time and I'm glad uh, that you are with us. Uh, I've always been fascinated by the Guptas and I think your book is such a lovely, uh, in-depth study into this very formative period of India's history, looking at coins, but not only looking at coins, but looking at coins as a part of a larger whole, though you focus on them. I'm going to start by going to the very beginning. How did this book really shape up? Well, the book is a uh, work of love. Um, I fell in love with these coins, the designs on these coins, going back when I was a little kid. My father was an army officer, and uh, uh, during his army career, he also finished to do uh, finished his uh, master's in history from Meerut University, and uh, he had a beautiful collection of coins. Uh, I was allowed to look at them, not touch them necessarily, because these gold coins were quite valuable on an army officer's salary. So, uh, you know, as a young kid uh, living in Delhi, I, I used to love going to the National Museum coin gallery. Of course, back then, none of us had any money to buy a ticket. So we always skipped over the fence and just entered for free and checked out the National Gallery. And it was uh, really just fascinating, you know, which kid hasn't dreamt of digging up a treasure of gold coins. And that was my, uh, I guess, my dream to have a collection of gold coins. Uh, and as I grew older and started seeing these uh, beautiful pieces of art. Uh, what was sad was to see that our history books never really uh, celebrated this art. We only got to see Greek art or Roman art. But here we had in these Gupta designs, Gupta kings that had uh, struck these beautiful gold coins, that art that rivaled the Roman art, the Greek art. So it it was basically something that fascinated from me from an art standpoint. And a little later in life, uh, it became apparent that studying this was very important to really understand what was the message these, uh, these designs were trying to show us, whether a king is standing there with a javelin in his hand or a battle axe in his hand or uh, playing the veena what does it mean? What are they trying to show? What are they trying to tell us? What are they trying to explain? Um, gold coins of, uh, uh, for example, uh, Kumar Gupta show him killing a rhinoceros, a hunting a rhinoceros. Well, a rhinoceros is, uh, you know, only found in northern regions or the east Assam region. Uh, did it mean that Kumar Gupta had actually captured that territory or some other Gupta hunting a tiger? Is it trying to convey that he was actually now in control of the Gangetic Plain? These are all things that these are hidden messages in these coins. And it it was basically like a jigsaw puzzle that had to be solved. And that's pretty much what the genesis of the book was all about. It is also a very updated version on the Guptas because you've referred to many, many works. And when you were talking about kids and their fascinations with uh, uh, digging gold, and I couldn't think but think of the Bayana Horde, which has such a wonderful story of kids playing. And this is the biggest uh, 
a hoard of Gupta coins that was found uh, uh, and uh, we've done a whole story on that but we'll come to the Bayana hoard and what it showed but let's put this period in context we know of course that the this was a very important phase in Indian uh, history because a lot of what we see as the iconography in, in, in Indian uh, Hindu religion was actually uh, shaped around the spirit of the Guptas and uh, uh, you know uh, if you just put this in the historical context for our viewers who are very familiar with the Gupta period I'm sure but just to put it in context as, as to why these coins are such a, a great uh, example or a great focal point for the study of the Guptas. Well you know the prior to the Guptas it was the Kushanas that were basically uh, ruling most of northern India going from Gandhara all the way to Varanasi. Uh, the Kushanas also, uh, while they primarily, you know, originated around the Afghanistan Gandharan region, uh, they used Mathura as their winter capital. Mm -hmm. So uh, Mathura became the epicenter of a lot of uh, inscriptions and art. And as the Kushan uh, uh, Empire, the dynasty, as it started waning uh, around uh, 320 AD, we start having uh, you know, uh, the Gupta dynasty rise up right around that Kanaj Kashi region. Mm -hmm. And what was going on at that time was there was a uh, revival of the Hindu Brahmanical uh, Vedic uh, thought process. And there was a big effort to basically codify what does Vishnu look like? What, how do we depict Shiva in his human form? What is he supposed to be holding in his right hand or his left hand? The Shilpa Shastra of the sculptures. How does Lakshmi, what is Lakshmi supposed to look like? You know, we we think of Lakshmi today and immediately we see her seated on a lotus with a lotus uh, in, bud in one hand, seated on a lotus flower. Well, that didn't exist back in the fourth century AD. That only came about primarily during the Gupta period when Samudra Gupta starts this uh, uh, this uh, phase and uh, we start seeing by the end of Samudra Gupta's reign we start seeing a goddess emerge uh, seated on a lotus under Chandra Gupta's time but under Samudra Gupta's time she's basically uh, uh, the lotus petals are starting to appear under her feet slowly uh, lotus bud is trying to appear in our hands these are all designs we see on the gold coins now the good thing about gold coins is they don't corrode you know copper coins they corrode lead coins don't last that well but gold coins basically hold their designs forever uh, unless they're damaged so this is a very important iconographic uh, evolution that we see during the gupta period it's just fascinating because we can actually document how these designs came about. Right. We'll talk about that because Lakshmi herself, uh, as depicted in the Gupta coins, is an interesting story, has very interesting roots, uh, perhaps in the Kushana Shaka uh, area of, of a more Central Asia, uh, Iran, Persia kind of a, a, a geographical spread. But let's talk about the dynasty itself, just to put it in context. So. The Guptas were in power for about 220 years from beginning to, to the decline. They were uh, they came in after a period of great unrest. Uh, they were they they gave stability after which there was unrest. So they are really a, a, a period of stability in Indian history. How can we look and understand the personality of the great rulers, be it Sabudra Gupta or Chandra Gupta one and Chandra Gupta two and Kumara Gupta, etc through their coins, when you have studied the coins for so long, do the personalities of these uh, rulers stand out? Yes, because, uh, you know, you have to consider that the gold coins were actually big propaganda pieces. Uh, this was a, what is gold used for? It is either used as a store of value or it is for large transactions. When they are trying to buy land, they buy it for three dinaras. The gold coins of Guptas were called dinaras, by the way. Um, and, the, you know, when we look at the uh, copper plate inscriptions where which were basically uh, documenting a land grant, they would say, you know, for three dinaras, we are buying this uh, piece of land for this temple, etc. So the these coins 
the designs and the coins and the legend that is written around the design in Brahmi and Gupta Brahmi shows what exactly was going on in their minds, whether they are getting ready for battle, if they're getting ready for battle. For example, when Chandragupta I comes to power, you know, a few of the key coins that he issues, one of them shows him on the back is in a design where they, the king and queen are seated on a couch, but it's emulating the Vyakuntha scene of Vishnu. Uh, and he's showing that he is, he's got the, he's, he's like a deity. He's got the divine uh, blessing to rule and have a, a power to expand his kingdom. Uh, he's shown holding a spear, inverted spear in his hand, basically doing uh, puja, uh, you know, in front of a fire haven. Um, you know, the Samudra Gupta either holding a bow and arrow in his hand or a uh, playing the uh, veena in his later years shows that, for example, the veena coin basically shows uh, that the, there was peace in the land as compared to the militaristic phase, which was the early phase of Samudra Gupta's uh, coinage, uh, where he was expanding the empire. In the expansion period, his coins are the bow and arrow in his hand, the javelin, the battle axe. The battle axe talk about him being the god of death, basically warning his neighboring kings that get out of my way. You know, I am the god of death coming your way. And if you don't get out of my way, you will basically die. The Ashwamedha coins, which is the horse sacrifice. So these are all beautiful images with messages. Uh, to the population telling them that you know I have the divine right to rule I have the I'm all powerful I'm valiant I'm generous uh, you know these are messages that help us understand what was going on in their mind for example if you take uh, coins of uh, um, Kumar Gupta for example you know we have a very beautiful really tiny coin i mean uh this is how tiny they are this is a little tiny where is it little tiny coin this is a skandagupta coin but kumar gupta's coin is this small it is a pratiga scene where it's the uh uh the he's being crowned as a king and these are all recorded you know these are in gold and in silver uh we find silver and lead coins we find actual dates on them uh, very, very rare coins, but by studying the dates, we can actually tell when these events were taking place. And these dates then help us correct the history as it's written, because our history books were, a lot of it was conjecture. A majority of our history during this, of this period was written in the 50s and 60s. And after that, it was mostly copy and paste, you know, no original research was done. And this, this kind of a book, pulls it all together and is able to set the record straight with facts which show, look, Chandragupta was actually in battle with the Shatraps, but it was only happening around, you know, 400 AD, not 415, not 380. You know, we have specific time period, uh, points in time we can point to and say, this is when things were happening. And this, these designs then, uh, emulate what the kings are trying to tell us sure sure you know uh, you you've actually uh, uh, spoken of busting a lot of myths uh, also talking about how uh, these coins were also used for propaganda and i'm going to pick out one story uh, which is really ramagupta's brief, brief stint and we know of course of chandragupta too and how he uh, protected his brother's wife. This is something that, you know, has, has come down to us through Sanskrit plays, etc. But your evidence shows otherwise. Can you tell us about this little incident? <laughs> <laughs> well, our history books say that, uh, you know, and talking of propaganda, Chandragupta uh, courtier Vishakadatta basically wrote this beautiful Sanskrit play called Devi Chandraguptam. And this play basically says that, you know, uh, Chandragupta, Maharaja Chandragupta, he's the most uh, valiant uh, and most uh, powerful king, but he protected the Gupta dynasty's honor by um, killing his brother Ram Gupta because Ram Gupta had brought shame on the uh, dynasty by uh, uh, 
you know, uh, he had basically uh, lost to the Shaka king and given his wife as a uh, uh, to the Shaka king uh, as a peace settlement. And, you know, these are all wrong. Uh, this was basically propaganda because, in fact, what happened was uh, Chandragupta killed Ramgupta to basically take take the crown. Uh, when Samudragupta died, Ramgupta was running, was the governor of Vidisha. Uh, now, why Vidisha? Vidisha is at the center of India. It is at the crossroads of the trade routes from north to south to east to west. And who, when Gupta kings always installed either a brother or a son as the governor of that Vidisha region. Uh, because if you control that region and the trade, you control the economy. Uh, so Ram Gupta is serving as governor of uh, Vidisha and Samadhar Gupta basically is in his last days and there is a struggle for who's going to control the uh, crown. Well, Ram Gupta is the older brother. So he therefore, you know, st uh, starts making uh, the waves to basically take the throne and he assumes the name Kach Gupta. Now, how do we know that? We have actually a copper coin. It's an Ashwamedha scene on the copper coin with Kach written below it. And on the back of the coin, it says Maharaja Ramagupta. So we have that link. And then he starts is issuing these gold coins where he's actually, instead of uh, uh, Garuda standard, which Garuda was the imperial uh, uh, symbol of the Gupta dynasty, instead of a Garuda uh, uh, sitting on a stand, which is on all the gold coins, uh, Kach Gupta is actually holding a Chakra Dhwaj, a Chakra standard, uh, basically a Dharm Chakra. I am the protector of the Dharm. I am the protector of the uh, the uh, values, and uh, this is what he issues prior to taking the throne. And then there is a fight uh, between Chandragupta and Ramgupta, and Ramgupta or Ch Kach Gupta, as he has taken the name, basically seizes control of the throne and. How do we know this is because there are three coins known in gold which are issued by the royal mint in this on these coins on the front of the coins we can see that in the past the garud dhwaj the garuda that was on the gold coins was missing but on this coin struck by the royal mint now we can see the garuda appear which shows that uh, the Garuda being on the coin signifies he is now the monarch. He is now in control of the throne. On the back of the coins, we see the goddess that has now uh, appeared holding a flower in her hand, which basically signifies Lakshmi and the divine right to rule. Um, but there are only three coins. So it's very clear that uh, his rule lasted very uh, for a short time. And uh, he was basically assassinated by Chandragupta II, who took over the throne, probably recalled most of these coins which had the Garuda on it, and melted them. Only three or four have survived. Well, this is the coin evidence, but we also have inscriptional evidence from the neighboring king, the Sangam uh, Sanjan copper plates, which talk of this shameful act where uh, uh, the Gupta uh, king has killed his older brother to take the throne. So we have inscriptional evidence and we have the evidence from the coins which can bring the story together and basically show that this Devi Chandragupta was basically a propaganda piece put out to basically, uh, you know, uh, color the story and make Chandragupta look like he was the good guy in this whole thing. So these are this is how coins actually help us. Rewriting history was a thing in the past too, but you know, the, the, what is interesting is that this is why we need multiple, uh, you know, angles in which to look at a particular event, a particular dynasty or a particular moment in history, because they all add to each other's, uh, you know, uh, uh, in our understanding. Before I come to some of the picks that you have for us uh, among these coins, I'm going to ask you about the evolution of Lakshmi. A lot has been spoken about it, but I think you have visual references to how the image of Lakshmi gets kind of uh, 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 developed into what we are familiar with today, right? The Gaja Lakshmi right. or the Lakshmi who's uh, holding uh, the, the the pot of gold, for instance, etc. To explain to us while we play out or, 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 or 
place these pictures explain to us how you see it evolve and over what time so around uh, the first century bc or so we start initially seeing a the iconography of lakshmi develop and the gaja lakshmi which is the two elephants you know uh, above lakshmi pouring water on her um it's during the gupta period that we actually start seeing codification of her attributes codification of what she's supposed to really look like as we recognize her as today uh, seated on a lotus uh, flower holding lotus buds in her hand what happened is uh, kushans uh, on the back of their coins used to show a deity by the name of ardaksho ardaksho was a iranian goddess of fortune she was a goddess that was seated on a throne and in her left hand she would be holding uh basically a cornucopia which is a horn of plenty now, this is going back to the goddess fortuna of rome roman uh, roman uh, times uh, same same kind of um, uh, iconography uh, goddess fortuna used to also hold a cornucopia so anyway uh once the uh, kushans developed this and this became basically their standard design on the back of all gold coins um uh, in the later part of the kushan uh, dynasty uh, now remember i mentioned earlier that the kushans uh, basically used mathura as their winter capital the gold coins of kushans were very high gold content and in trade they became the standard currency during that time uh, as a trusted currency so these this design of uh, goddess ardaksho uh, was quite popular in north india then once the kushans uh, disintegrated the empire disintegrated uh, here comes uh, chandragupta one and starts expanding his empire uh, we start seeing that on the back of uh, the coins um, from chandragupta one to samudragupta we start seeing the goddess design change the goddess design on the back of these coins starts changing from a goddess ardaksho to a indian goddess and over the 40 odd years of samudragupta's reign we can actually see that slowly this seated goddess seated on a throne starts having uh, lotus petals appear below her feet and as time goes by in these gold coins we start seeing designs where uh she still she still has uh lotus uh, uh petals under her leaves but she's holding the cornucopia as time goes back that by the cornucopia changes to a lotus flower and then at the end of samudragupta's term uh, uh reign and into chandragupta uh, two, we start seeing this new design appear, which is Goddess Lakshmi seated uh, on a lotus. Throne has disappeared, and now she's only holding holding the lotus flower. This is captured in the gold coins uh, during this period of 340 AD to about 380 AD. This 40, 50 year period was the most crucial period in India's history where they actually codified what our deities were supposed to look like yes and across vidisha which you mentioned uh, of course you have the earliest references to this iconography in udayagiri in eran and that entire belt which we've done a lot of work on sajeev uh, apart from lakshmi a uh, uh, kind of you traced to nana uh, another uh, uh, figure who, who is very omnipresent in some of the earlier coins and you have ganga coming uh, into prominence now ganga also is a very prominent figure in Udayagiri, in, in all the iconography that you see in that Gupta trail that we have done now. Uh, do talk about these two. So I'll start with Ganga. For example, you know, as you, uh, one of the other videos you had done where you talked about the Gupta era temples, one of the key features of a Gupta era temple for the first time was to have Ganga and Yamuna on the outside of the temples. And of course, you know, the water being the sustenance of our uh, culture and life and civilization, these were important uh, deities that became very par part and parcel of our temples. Mm -hmm. Now, goddess uh, Ganga, uh, according to the mythology, emerges from Ganga 
uh, from Ganges holding a lotus flower in her hand and she actually is riding her vahana is uh, her vehicle is the myth mythological animal the um, creature the uh, makra so the makra is uh, shown uh, with goddess ganga riding on this creature uh, on the back of few of the coins uh, struck by samudra gupta the the tiger slayer type very important uh, coin uh, but this shows us this actually we are able to pinpoint the time when this actually came about this came about the same time as those temples were built that you had uh, highlighted earlier the uh, the coins were struck uh, now when were these tiger slayer coins with goddess ganga struck very early in samudra gupta's reign because when we look at the figure he's shown in a as a young youthful muscular man hold firing his arrow uh, from the bow at a tiger that is pouncing at him so this is a young samudra gupta and on the back of the coin it does not say maharaja or maharaja dhiraja it says Raja Samudra Gupta. So it basically shows that this was a young uh, prince or maybe even just a young uh, king. So we can date this evolution of Ganga, goddess Ganga uh, appearing on the Indian scene around 340 AD. It's very easy to point that rather than saying it was at the end because comparatively, when you look at coins of the lyrist type, the Veena type, we see an older monarch. He's shown as an old man playing the Veena. Now coming back to Durga, very important. Goddess Durga actually evolves from Goddess Nana, who's an Iranian goddess. And she in uh, Goddess Nana is usually shown seated on a lion. Now remember I talked about Kushan coins where we have a uh, goddess on a throne. In early coins struck around mid 300 AD, we start seeing uh, on the gold coin appearing where she's got her feet resting on a lion. And this generally, uh, this becomes a major design around Chandragupta II, where this goddess is based, uh, subduing a lion by seated, by being seated on it. And why do we see this? You, during Samudra Gupta's rule, when Samudra Gupta was uh, expanding his empire, he never was able to con conquer Gujarat mm -hmm. and that region because that region had the ports going to Alexandria and trade with Rome. That was under the control of Shatrapa kings, the Shaka kings. So uh, Samudra Gupta basically stopped at the border with the Shatrapas and literally let them left them alone. Chandragupta comes around 386, 389 AD, and uh, by about 400 AD, we start seeing him uh, basically uh, taking control of a lot of the Gujarat region, uh, Gujarat area. So, Gir Forest is where the lions are found, and the 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 symbology there is that I am defeating the lions i have i'm powerful i can kill the lion so that's where uh, a lot of the symbology in uh, the front of the coin where we have the king possibly with a uh, some design show him with a sword trying to kill a lion on the uh, or with a bow and arrow trying to kill a lion um some coins with even with a spear trying to kill a lion and then uh, we have uh, on the back, we have goddess Durga, which is actually Simavahani Lakshmi. She's a goddess Lakshmi holding a lotus, sitting on a lion, in many cases, dropping coins with her uh, hand. This imagery starts appearing. And during this period, what we see is as time goes by, the design gets codified. Uh, the throne that was the goddess was seated in a throne in many coins we see the throne and also the lion where the goddess is seated on a lion lion and there is actually a remnants of a throne back behind her and then as time goes by the throne disappears and then all we see is the goddess seated in a lion so this is the evolution of the actual design of durga
Right. And you, of course, through your answers, have also uh, spoken about how the territorial expansion, in a sense, is also reflected in these coins. But let's move on. You've You've covered a lot of ground with coins and, you know, we've got a fantastic reference point. But what are the two, three or let's say four or five coins that really stand out for you? Coins that you just love because it's always that little, uh, you know, the favorites among collectors. Oh my gosh, that is such a difficult question because if I only had four or five coins, I would have stopped at four or five, not thousands. I know, I know. <laughs> it's, it's a tough question, sorry. Um, you actually... You know, we have uh, the cover of my book, which uh, it's mm. copy is sitting right there. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so cover of my book shows a King Samudragupt standing with an inverted javelin in his left hand. He is doing what is called the Ayodh Puja, the, the religious ceremony prior to going to battle, the worship of weapons. Uh, weapons and tools. This is a very symbolic uh, scene. Uh, and the reason I chose this coin for the cover was this design is just fascinating. You know, on the top of his head, we see a Chandra crown, a, co a crescent moon. Uh, he is just so regal. And uh, in front of him is what we call a Garudhava, you know, the Garuda standing on a, a pedestal. We also see, uh, for example, uh, one of the other favorite coins is the Tiger Slayer coin that I was uh, referring to. That design is just amazing. And uh, it is, uh, you know, it is a very beautiful design rivaling the Roman and the Greek art. Another excellent coin is, uh, for example, the uh, Vena coin, where the king is playing a lyre, lyre, you know, uh, stringed instruments. It's so beautiful that you can actually see the individual strings around his fingers. Um, beautiful coins like the Aswamedha type, where the king is actually doing the horse uh, worship before letting the horse lose. Uh, and uh, we have the elephant slayer coin where King Kumar Gupta is riding an elephant into battle. Another beautiful coin, you said four or five, I have quite a few coins, <laughs> beautiful coins. Uh, there is a beautiful type of uh, coin in Gupta's called the battle axe coin, where a King Samudra Gupta is actually holding a battle axe in his hand. Beautiful designs. Um, I mean, there are hundreds of coins, you know, there's the King and Lakshmi type of Skand Gupta. We should talk about Skand Gupta. Skand Gupta is a king that has, uh, did not get a lot of credit in history books. Uh, he, his coin of King and Lakshmi type um, is actually one of the most uh, iconic coins of the Gupta dynasty. He was not from raw blood um, and his, you know, we talked about Ram Gupta and Kach Gupta and Chandra Gupta, Game of Thrones. This was Game of Thrones part two when Skand Gupta came to uh, power. Uh, what happened is um, Chandra Gupta too, his, fa uh, his grandfather uh, had uh, married off his daughter Prabhavati Gupta to the Vakataka king um, to basically have a marriage alliance so that they could live peacefully. Well, she literally ruled the Vakataka uh, empire because her husband died at a very young age and she basically became the regent queen. So she kept peace in that region. But when Kumar Gupta uh, was at the end of his reign, uh, the Vakatakas rose up and wanted to basically install Ghatot Kach, who was uh, uh, Skand Gupta's uh, uh, brother, as the king and Skandgup basically puts down that rebellion. Now in the Junagad uh, rock inscriptions, there is, a, there is a reference to Nagas rising up. And you know, historians have incorrectly identified the Nagas as some hill people and whatnot. 
the Nagas are the Nagas of Padmavati. The Nagas and Vakatakas had marriage alliance. They were married to each other. They were a powerful force in the Gujarat and the Malwa region. These Naga and Vakataka armies basically rose up against to fill the void that Margupta, as he was in his last days, going to have. And Skandgupta, in charge of the Gupta army, basically puts down that rebellion. And Junagadh, which is, of course, in Gujarat, is where he puts that rock inscription and says, I came here, I have conquered the Nagas, and they are done. I am in control. And we we have lead coins issued in that Junagadh area. So these are these coins, you know, whether they're gold coins or lead coins or silver coins, these are just data banks of information, <laughs> literally. Absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, talking about uh, women also, you know, uh, Prabhavati Gupta is a very interesting character. You know, again, you know, I have actually gone to Nagardhan, which was her old capital, uh, you know, and, and, and been part of an archaeological dig over there. But what is also interesting is for the Guptas, marriage alliances were very important. You have the starting off with the Lichavi princess, you know, which Chandragupta That's one correct. does. Then you have that whole story of um, Chandragupta II with Dhruva Devi, again a very important figure. And there are coins with the king and queen. So how are women That's represented, good. the royal women represented in the coins? Uh, prominently. Uh, you know, it is interesting that uh, in our, uh, our Hindu dynasty, really uh, featured these uh, queens, uh, the, the king and queen type that you mentioned. It uh, starts out with the first king, the Chandragupta one, the first very first gold coin struck by uh, King Chandragupta one, like I mentioned earlier, shows him seated with his queen on a couch. And then later on, uh, the king and queen type coins are struck, which show him basically standing on the front of the coin. We see him standing with his queen, offering her either a ring, or Sindhur, different coins, by the way, show different uh, things being held in the king's hand. Queens were very important and powerful during that time. Um, and, and as we saw with Prabhavati Gupta, she basically kept the peace for almost 40 plus years in that region. So yeah, right. very well depicted. Right. You know, the mention of Vikramaditya also brings brings uh, to the, uh, you know, for another question, which you've spoken about extensively. There's this great mix mystery on who Vikramaditya was. And you have, uh, have uh, you know, uh, said that looking at the coins, it seems that he was like a phantom like figure because all the all the Gupta kings did adopt the title Vikramaditya in some form. So it might be for a generation of kings rather than a single individual. Please explain that. So think of Vikramaditya as a title taken by kings across ancient India in a way to consider themselves the most valorous, the most benevolent, the most powerful kings. It was a title adopted by almost uh, hundreds, uh, not hundreds, many, many kings. Um, the first use of Vikramaditya comes from the Malwa area, the Malwa tribe, chief of the Malwa tribe of Ujjaini, uh, who initiated the Vikrama Samvat around uh, era around 57 BC. Uh, after that, we find uh, when Chandragupta I comes to power uh, after the Kushanas, the, he adopts an imperial title, a Biruda, which is called, which is Vikramaditya or on his coins is list, listed as Sri Vikrama. Um, this title continues to be used for the next 220 years by different, different kings uh, in the Gupta dynasty. And they keep using versions of it, either Sri Vikrama or Vikramaditya on their coins, because during that time, Two things were very important. One was uh, the memory of a great king for with the population. You know, in uh, far off reaches of the empire, it was easier to explain that this you are under the rule of King Vikramaditya than to say, oh, by the way, you are under the rule of you know Chandragupta II or you know Kumar Gupta III. Vikramaditya was a common all-encompassing name. 
and it this is very similar to the concept of uh coins you know when coins were issued it was a function of trust uh, a coin and a currency can only be accepted by a population if there is trust in it and how does one get trust a trust comes when people see familiar uh, designs familiar names on this on the on the uh, coins and whenever we in history whenever a territory was conquered the kings ended up issuing currency in their name but using the designs that were already prevalent in that region for sure. example when kushans basically died off and guptas came they copied the kushan currency when chandragupta too basically conquered the gujarat region his silver coins issued were identical to the silver coins issued by shatrapa kings only difference was now it said chandragupta's name on it and it had a garud instead of three arch hills or something else so yeah. this is a ongoing uh, this this vikramaditya concept is basically the king saying i'm all powerful all benevolent and there was not a we, when we use the word vikramaditya we cannot say it was one single king we have to say okay which vikramaditya are you talking about there was also satvahana vikramaditya because you know the the vikram yes, samvat yes. is also attributed to him but uh, yeah. moving on you know uh, the gupta empire rose amidst great chaos and that is why they they say that you know they went back to the iconography the whole concept of kalyug came and the whole strife of the period was uh, you know something that kind of influenced how faith shaped but it also ended with a very massive invasion right with the hunas coming down nirakula and you know uh, all of that what happened to the gupta coinage because they had copious amounts of gold coins but gold like you said yes it doesn't get uh, it 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 perhaps lasts the longest but it also gets melted the fastest and in india we are a gold obsessed country so i mean there have been multiple layers of me- melting of gold coins so what happens to these coins and how is it that we find these hoards like bayana etc in different parts uh, and uh, give us a picture of mental picture of what has been found so the hunas start making their advance uh, towards the end of uh, around 500 AD or so after buddha gupta we actually have inscriptions where buddha gupta is involved in battles uh, uh with the hunas and uh, when we have uh, for example there is a coin in the gupta uh, uh coinage called uh, with the title with the name the king is using the name prakasha ditya the prakasha ditya is actually a coin issued by tormana the huna king in the name of a gupta design in a gupta name because again this was a currency that had to be accepted a good high percentage of gold in the coin and it but it emulates the gupta coinage around uh, uh that only lasted for about 20 years or so and then you know the gupta dynasty basically uh, dies off and we find a big void in gold coins uh till the 11th 12th century when the sultanates start coming uh into and establishing themselves in india and the reason is that in order for a gold currency to be issued uh there has to be a vast resources under the control of a king that you know the guptas controlled the vast portion of north and central india uh these resources were easy for them with trade with roman gold coming in melted and made into gupta gold coins so what we find is even today in this uh, madhya pradesh up kota jaipur rajasthan all the way to the lucknow varanasi area the kashi kanauj region we find tons of gold coins found all the time and even today as far back as just a few months back and the reason is gold coins were continued to be used as a medium of exchange and currency even though the kushanas had died off a thousand years back and guptas had died off 700 years back they continued to be used as currency uh it because it was you know approximately 8 grams and it and the moneyers and the goldsmiths knew that this much real gold is in it and it was accepted so it it continued and no other 
big dynasty came in till about the 12th century or so to replace that coinage. And when they came, they probably found all the gold coins, melted them and, you know, issued it in their name as the Sultanates or the Mughals did. Um, as far as the hoards go, you know, the Bayana hoard is a very important uh, resource for us. Uh, when it was first found, uh, Maharaja of Bharatpur basically uh, tried to get his hands on it. There were about 2100 gold coins, it's estimated. Only about a 1900 some coins were actually recovered because the villagers who found it actually started melting them, knowing fully well that at one point they would they would get confiscated. Um, and, uh, you know, I'll share some images with you where you'll see the Maharaja of Bharatpur actually gifted you know, 150 coins to the National Museum, to the Bharat Kala Bhavan, to this museum, that museum. And then so many were left over. He just made jewelry out of them, buttons for his blazer out of them. And I ended up finding uh, quite a few of them in uh, auctions in the United States. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. The coin is beautifully encased in a clasp without damaging it. On the back, it says Bayana Hode, the name of the king. And uh, in fact, there's a funny story. Uh, many, many moons back uh, when I was a young man, just newly married to my wife, we didn't even have a couch in our house, but we had a house, but we didn't even have a couch. I went to this coin show and found this one Bayana Hood coin for a Tiger Slayer coin, beautiful one for $750. That was a lot of money back then. So I thought, oh, well, you know, I'm going to take one. There were seven of them in that group. I got came back told my wife, I showed it to her. She's like, amazing. This is beautiful. Why didn't you buy the rest of them? And I'm like, what? You, you're you okay with me buying the rest of them? She's like, yeah, you should buy the rest of them. They're really valuable. And I'm like, but we don't even have a couch. And she's like, okay, it's okay. Just go buy them. So I picked up a few. So, you know, uh, when you are trying to do these collections and uh, these kind of it's important when your spouse supports it too <laughs> so yeah uh, so today it's a big collection but thanks to my wife's blessings also right Sajiva. and and it's a good point to note and and of course acknowledge because absolutely a collection can grow only that way and you know it's so fascinating to hear you talk uh, Sanjeev uh, and and share with us your insights I would love to come and see the collection one day and absolutely. You know, uh, and and look at it with you but uh, it has been a wonderful conversation many thanks for joining us and uh, taking us to the world of the Guptas through their coins thank you so much thank you for your